bottom line, what did you find? We were gonna win this case. And that's the most significant point I wanna to make to the public out there. You know, th this was the first time in our knowledge that the writ of quo warranto had been used to really define the contours of prosecutorial discretion. But as we dug into the case, and as the case moved, and certainly after we filed the amended petition, it became abundantly clear we were going to win. And how would you characterize the office? It was a dysfunctional, uh, you know, the judge has called it a rudderless ship of chaos. I think that's a very accurate statement. And, you know, one of the things that we were able to corroborate, we, we certainly had the evidence that the internal workings of the office were completely dysfunctional, that her absence, her misdirection, her uh, attack on, on her own staff had caused a decay in morale and operations to the point that the criminal justice system just wasn't functioning anymore. And again, that was her fault. She did that. Uh, and once she resigned and we were appointed to move into the office and assist and stand in the gap until such time as the governor could make a more permanent appointment, uh, certainly our observations, uh, being having attorneys in that office, corroborated everything we knew to be true. Absolutely. Um, what was the most surprising finding for you? You know, I think it's the numbers, just the, the, the raw data. The, the, this, this had gone beyond uh, negligence. This had exceeded the, the, the bounds of prosecutorial discretion. Again, prosecutorial discretion is about reviewing the four corners of a police report to determine if there's sufficient evidence for a charge, what the charge should be, and ultimately what the disposition in the case should be. But this woman was dedicated to dismantling the criminal justice system, and she was effective at that. I mean, she had essentially shut down uh, 28 different police officers from being able to make law enforcement referrals to her office. She had completely stopped charging armed criminal action, which is one of the best tools that prosecutors have uh, to carry a mandatory minimum against violent offenders who are using weapons and dangerous instruments to commit crimes on our street. Uh, you know, she was using uh, an unlicensed attorney. Uh, that we, we have every reason to believe that she was using an unlicensed attorney to help evaluate cases, which, uh, again, these are enormously problematic. But it, she came to office with the stated intention of reducing in incarceration. She did that by simply not doing her job or doing it the wrong way. And that uh, unlicensed attorney, I'm just assuming, is Maurice Foxworth? Correct. Okay, just want to make sure. How bad was all of this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is really difficult for me to put uh, quantification on the, uh, the loss of life, the, the human suffering, you know, the, the, the blood in the streets, the victims mm -hmm. who never got their day in court. Certainly, we can, we can quantify property damage. We can quantify, uh, you know, crimes reported and, and unprosecuted. You know, we, we know that basically 96% of crimes reported, she wouldn't file charges on. So she's only doing about 4% of her job. And that 4% is a little bit generous because she was using procedural chicanery to dismiss and refile cases in order to get around the rules of discovery. And so uh, th that 4% counts those cases twice. So we can, we can quantify in those terms, but where, where we struggle is, again, in, in the, the toll on, on the people, uh, the citizens of the city of St. Louis, the, the visitors to St. Louis, um, you know, the, those victims who, who never got their day in court under her administration. Gotcha. Um, Janae Edmondson, what should her office have done in that case? What should have happened? Well, she should have objected to Daniel Riley being released on bond. This is a repeat violent offender who should have never been on the streets. And she lied to the public about this because in February she said that she had objected to Daniel Riley's bond. Well, in the city of St. Louis, all actions that are taken in court are recorded three ways. There are memos submitted by the attorneys, there are docket entries that the judges put into case net, and there are memos, or excuse me, there are transcripts from the proceedings themselves. And so the evidence bears out that not only did she not object to Daniel Riley's bond, she consented. She agreed that he should be out on the street, and now poor Janae Edmondson is serving a life sentence because of her willful refusal to do her job. And is it fair to say that it never should have happened? It never should have happened. He should have never been out on the street. And shame on her and her assistants for allowing him to, to walk free, to, to consenting to him being released on bond. Again, this is a violent repeat offender, and we can point to the harm that was caused. And that's just one case. This is not an isolated incident. This is a pattern of behavior from the time she took office until she finally left. And one wonders how many more victims would have uh, been made, you know, had she been allowed to remain in office. Why is going to nursing school a problem? 
Well, there's a statute that governs the behavior of the circuit attorney and requires that she dedicate her full time and energy to the discharge of her official duties. That means prosecuting cases. She wasn't doing that. Come to find out, it's because she was doing something else. She was going to nursing classes. That's not part of her official duties. And so that's one of the things we recommend in the report, that there needs to be some teeth in those public duty doctrines. There needs to be an action that can be taken when you've got public officials who are refusing to do their job because they're pursuing other endeavors uh, on company time, on public time. Uh, that, that there needs to be teeth behind those statutes to hold those wrongdoers accountable. We use the quo waranto to do it, and we're successful. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the statutes on the books in the state of Missouri need to be enhanced and improved to address this kind of situation in the future. Um, when we talk about the timing of her resignation, why do you think she resigned the way she did? Well, she hit the eject button because we were going to court that day. She had documents that had to be turned over as part of discovery. She had a deposition on the books scheduled. Uh, we were going to be in court two hours after she resigned, and the judge was, had already ordered certain discovery and was about to order more. And so it is clear, based on the record, that she resigned because of this quo Waranto action. She resigned because she knew she was going to have to go to court that afternoon and answer tough questions that she didn't want to have to answer. Gotcha. Um, there was also some discussion I, I read in the report about the fact that she and her office failed to turn over any information to you all. So how much do we still not know about her administration? Well, there are a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, she litigated the case much like she ran her office, and that was an attempt to vex, harass, and delay the public from understanding what was going on. And it's shameful that she was allowed to behave this way for this long and then got away with it in the Quo Veranto case. You know, again, I think that is why it's so important that the General Assembly look at updating these statutes. Public officials who are facing a legal removal from office should not be able to slip out in the, in the middle of the night and avoid the negative consequences. There has to be some teeth behind those statutes. But I also think that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there is a reason behind all of the records that we had subpoenaed. Every document that we requested, there was a specific purpose behind that. And the city is still in possession of many of those records and is probably under the legal obligation to turn most of that stuff over if requested. So can you still get that information now that she's gone? Yeah, the, the, the information is accessible by the public and certainly by the attorney general's office. Are you going to, so she wouldn't hand over anything. But now she's gone. So in theory, you could still get it? Yeah, I think those documents are still available through other means outside of the formal discovery process, as far, outside of the Quo Waranto proceeding. And certainly, we will take action to obtain the, the necessary documents. And I, I do think there's more work to be done here to make sure that the, the public understands what went wrong and to prevent it from ever happening in the future. And the public's entitled to that information, so we don't repeat the same mistakes again. OK, so your investigation, Quo Waranto may be done, but your investigation could continue based on the fact that there's more documents and more information you didn't get that first time around. Yeah, that's correct. Again, she got she resigned in order to avoid having to turn those records over. The city is still in possession of those records. We're going to seek to obtain those records because what we can't allow is for her to come back into office and make the same mistakes again that were allowed to happen previously. Okay, so this isn't over. Not yet. Okay. Um, th that sort of, and you've kind of answered this question, um, through some of our discussion already, but so we know all this stuff about her office now. Okay, great. What can be done to hold her accountable? Yeah, well, I, again, I think that's where reviewing the documents that were requested as part of the formal discovery process and the Quo Moranto is going to be so critical. I mean, she we knew she made some really egregious decisions while she was in office. The, the documents will demonstrate uh, the level of liability that will result from those decisions. And so, I mean, the law is clear. It says you should devote your entire time to the duties of your office. We know she wasn't doing that. So what's the consequence? Well, and that's the problem, is that these statutes oftentimes are antiquated. Uh, they were passed in an age where everyone abided by the rule of law, or at least respected the rule of law. She did the opposite. It's time for us to update the statutes. It's not just the statutes. It's the procedural rules that govern the Quo Moranto proceedings. Those haven't been uh, updated in quite some time. And with the fast pace of the world today, we need to be able to gain access to discovery more quickly so that we can take s swift action to hold wrongdoers accountable. Do you have any idea where she is now? I don't. I mean, did she graduate? Did she? You, have, you don't know. Luckily, she's not in the circuit attorney's office because the people of St. Louis and the people of the state of Missouri would still be suffering if she were there. Okay. And 
Um, so again, we talked about this too, but just for um, my purposes as well. You also talked about the changes to the victim's bill of rights that need to happen. So as a result of this investigation, what needs to change? Yeah, well, too often the Kim Gardner refused to notify or inform, confer with victims as is her constitutional and statutory uh, obligation under the law, but also it's a moral obligation for prosecutors. I mean, we seek justice for victims when we sit in the, the role of prosecuting attorneys, and she refused to do that, failed to do that. Uh, too many victims suffered. Where we saw that uh, occur too frequently was in motions for post-conviction relief. She was using PCR proceedings to get wrongdoers out of prison and back on the streets and would never notify the victims of that. And so it's time that we update our state statutes to ensure that the victim's rights are extended to those proceedings as well. So, and I think I did one of those stories, in fact I know I did, um, that one murder case um, where he walked out of jail, all that stuff. But are, were there multiple instances of that? Post-conviction relief yeah. proceedings? Or was that the, the one that really... The, yeah, yeah, that's the one that, that comes to mind okay. instantly. But I, I would say that, you know, the... The criminal justice system is supposed to be an adversarial proceeding where you have the state on one side and the criminal defendant on the other. And the adversarial process is intended to get to the truth. They use the rules of evidence and court procedure to get to that point. That's the objective. But when you have someone like Kim Gardner, who's not adversarial to the defendant, who is in line with the defendant ideologically and, and outcome, to, you know, wants the same outcome. Those PCR hearings become a venue, an avenue for uh, someone like Kim Gardner to let people out of prison. And that, the law was never intended to, to do that. And victims need to be looped in. Victims need to know if their assailant uh, is going to be released so that they can prepare accordingly. And they need to have a say in that process. Gotcha. And that's what, that would require a change in the legislature. Yeah, a change in the statute is the best way to accomplish that, to ensure that the victim's rights are extended to post-conviction relief hearings. Now, some would argue the change you're proposing or recommending about, you know, giving more teeth to the quo Ronto process as far as, you know, requiring that someone cannot run for office again if they resign under charges or under investigation. I mean, that can be a bit of a slippery slope. Yeah, it can, but I think it also speaks to how infrequently the quo waranto is used. If you look at the history of the state of Missouri, there have not been many instances in which the state has needed to use the check and balance provided by the people's elected representatives and codified into statute. Uh, certainly, this is the first time, that, that, to our knowledge, that the quo waranto had been used again to define the contours of prosecutorial discretion and to ensure that uh, prosecutors are filing their cases and notifying victims in, of the proceedings and conferring with victims. So I feel like uh, some may say that, yeah. you know, it could be a slippery slope yeah. if you're talking about, let's put in the law that if someone resigns, because the chances here are clear. She could run for office again. Yeah. And you think that people in her position that are resigned under, you know, investigation should not be allowed to do that. Well, I would say we had gone well beyond investigation. We had filed a quo Baranto a action based on the evidence we had that evidence grew exponentially in the short amount of time the proceeding was underway, causing us to file an amended petition. So we had crossed the Rubicon. Again, we were going to win this case. There was sufficient evidence there to have her removed and probably make sure she never came back again. And so you shouldn't be able to avoid the consequences by just slinking out into the night. Um, at the point that the state moves in to file a quo Baranto, the state is under the legal obligation to have sufficient evidence to support that action. And certainly we did. Okay. Because, I mean, certainly it's no secret, you two are on polar opposite ends of the political spectrum. Yeah. And so some of her supporters certainly argued this was nothing more than a political move on yeah. your part to get rid of her. So how do you, you know, that's what I mean by slippery slope. Sure. Like if you have political enemies, yeah. you know. Well, people that are using the system to obtain a political ambition as opposed to public good are abusing the system. Kim Gardner did that. But I would also point out that what we did upon her resignation by moving into that office, by 
immediately reestablishing the warrant office and taking warrant referrals from the police department by being on the scene of a homicide to help assist with warrant application that night to help prep cases for trial, get discovery out the door, to file new charges, to ensure that the charges that were filed were bound over to circuit court to, to ensure that uh, the system functioned from the day we were in that office demonstrates that this wasn't about political ambition. This was about the public good. It would have been easy to remove her and be done with it. But we stepped up to the plate to stand in the gap to ensure that the criminal justice system in the city of St. Louis functioned, and we turned it around very quickly. Okay. And again, you know, just to kind of drive home this point, people that have heard all of the egregious things that have gone on and, and the results of your investigation, I mean, your investigator physically saw her at clinicals and at nursing school while she was supposed to be doing her job for the, for the taxpayers in the city. People really want to know how is she going to be held accountable for any of this? Yeah, well, and again, it's uh, it's going to be up to the city to turn over those records that we've requested, and that, that's we're part of a formal subpoena in a legal proceeding, and the city's still in possession of many of those records, and I think that that will establish uh, her liability points. Okay, so if I'm explaining it, I just want to make sure I'm explaining yeah. it correctly. You're still waiting for more documents to come through, so it remains to be seen how she will be held accountable. Yeah, I would say that... Because yeah. uh, can your office well, do yeah. anything? Let me, let me make this point. Her resigning two hours before she went to court when those documents would have had to have been turned over is proof positive that there's a lot of smoke there for there not to be any fire. We're going to continue to pursue it and get to the bottom of it. And so let's say you get to the bottom of it and it shows you know she was doing all of that schooling and that's a direct violation of the law, then what? Do you charge her with a crime? Like, what would that crime be? Fraud? I mean, I don't, how would that look? Yeah, I mean, there are different liability points here. I mean, number one, there's professional licensure liability points. Certainly she had had run-ins with the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel in the past. Uh, and so, the, you know, she's got liability there. She's got civil liability where she undertook uh, duties that were not part of her official duties and thereby waived her sovereign immunity. If there were, was harm caused because of those behaviors, potentially there's liability there as well. And certainly if there's any evidence that she was stealing from the public fisc, that's problematic on a criminal level. People want to know how she's going to be held accountable for everything that you found in this investigation. Well, I think there's several liability points. Number one, she'd already been in trouble with the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel, and I think that uh, that's going to be up to the judiciary to decide you know, whether her licensure is at risk. But I also think that when you have a prosecutor that conducts behavior or conducts activities that are outside of the scope of their statutory authority, they run into a, a potential waiver of sovereign immunity. So there could be a civil suit if somebody can establish damages based on that. And certainly if she is stealing from the public coffers, uh, that's something that it, it attaches criminal liability as well. We, it, her license could be in jeopardy. And then the second part of that is if it is, can be proven that she was doing the nursing thing while she was supposed to be in office, that could be considered stealing and that could be a criminal offense. Yeah, and I think the, the, the biggest fount of liability here is when you have, the, when public officials exceed the scope of their statutory authority and act under the color of official duties. That is a waiver that potentially waives sovereign immunity. And then they're subject to civil liability for any damage they cause. And so when you've got a prosecutor, again, who's dedicated to dismantling the criminal justice system, rather than fulfilling her proper adversarial role therein, there, there could be civil liability as well. Gotcha. Um, any other points that you want to make? Any other you know, things you think are important to mention? Yeah, if this was a political attack against someone of a different party, there is no way we would have sent attorneys into that office that very afternoon to reestablish the work that the circuit attorney's office is supposed to be doing. We weren't just here to take her out. We were here to restore law and order and find justice for victims. All right. Yeah, it's definitely a point that has come up often in all of this. Um, and so there's more to come. This isn't over. Certainly, we will continue to pursue access to records that we believe will establish those liability points against Kim Gardner. All right. Sounds good. I think we're good. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Can I do one other point? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, yes. I just, you know, it was important for us to publish the Gardner report to put into the public domain, again, what went wrong here, 
how it happened and what systems need to put, be put in place to prevent it from ever happening in the future. The public is entitled to know the mistakes that she made. And she tried to deprive the public of access to that information by resigning before the court could order disclosure of several of those records. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Why even do this report? Why come out with all of this now? Yeah, yeah the, the point, again, is to, to ensure that the, the public has access to the information. And, and it's part of the historical record as well.